Okay, great. Thank you all again for being here tonight. As you can just tell, we have a great panel for you. And uh, I just want to say as part of Education Lab, equity has been one of the major themes we've explored in part of our coverage when it comes to school discipline, as well as gifted education, um, access to rigorous courses, and also school finance. Um, and also the makeup of the teaching force. Uh, we recently wrote about a report from the University of Washington um, that found that even as the diversity of our student body in Washington State is increasingly getting more diverse, the teaching force is getting less diverse. I think uh, they, they pegged it now at as 90% of the 60,000 teachers in Washington State are white. Um, so that's one of the issues we'll address tonight along with many others. Um, so let's get started. And I thought I'd start by asking each of our panelists to say a little bit about what communities they identify with, um, as well as when they were in school, did they have very many teachers that shared their background? Um, Saraswati? Yeah. Um, so again, my name is Saraswati Noel, and um, I identify as um, biracial, as Malaysian, Indian, and white. And I moved to the US um, when I was three from Malaysia. Um, and in my school, I went to Roosevelt High School in Seattle and did not, in my experience, really have very many teachers, um, just teachers of color at all. Um, yeah, so my name is Jesse Hagopian and uh, I identify as black and mixed race. Um, my mom is of Armenian descent and her family came here. Um, actually, my great-grandfather, Ardash, came here on my mom's side um, from Armenia during the genocide. He actually um, left Armenia. Uh, it was out of the country during the genocide that our, our government doesn't acknowledge, um, one of the few in the world that doesn't acknowledge it. And then he came here um, to escape that. And on my dad's side uh, is black and um, survived a different kind of genocide. And that, that struggle um, really informs a lot of my perspective. And as a, as a student, I went to Garfield High School, and you know that perspective was missing from a lot of my classes. And I had very few teachers of color. I had one teacher, Paulette Thompson, that I really connected with, um, a wonderful teacher uh, here in the Seattle Public Schools that was in one of our progressive education programs, the middle college that got pushed out um, and, and shut down, and it, it's really a shame. Uh, good evening. Again, my name's Joy Williamson Lott. Um, I identify as a black cisgender woman. In, I'm not from Seattle. I'm a transplant. I'm from a suburb of Chicago. And growing up, I had two black female teachers in in uh, my grade school years, and that's because my, well, they taught at the school, there were two different classrooms, and my parents specifically requested for me to be in those classrooms, and that might have been the last time I had uh, a teacher of color until I got to college, but I just wanna say one of the things that I got out with, a, the biggest impact that I had with the teacher, when I went to college, I didn't have a major for two years, I was just kinda there hanging out, uh, taking classes, I was taking classes. Uh, <laughs> um, and I double majored in psychology and speech communications, but I'm a historian of education. That's what I got my master's and doctoral degrees in. And it's because I met a black male professor who was a historian of education who changed the course of my life. And he is, that experience with him, he is the reason that I am the historian of education that I am today. And so I just use that as, as an example. Of, I never had to, I wrote, I write about black people, and I've never had to explain why I thought that was important or, or valid or that I could be objective in his presence in a way that I had had to do in other contexts. Uh, Nathan Simonow, uh, I grew up in Southern California from the IE. Uh, I, of course, had lots of teachers that look like me, so I'm white, uh, and I'm also part of the LGBT community. Uh, I, however, though, had zero teachers ever growing up that were LGBT. Uh, I now know that I had three teachers in high school that, <laughs> uh, that were uh, all lesbian two of them that were actually married to each other. Um, but at no point did I ever have a gay teacher growing up ever, and certainly never had uh, a more effeminate man at the front of the classroom 
uh, ever in my education. Good evening, my name is Sharon Navas. I, um, as my bio says, my mom is from Guatemala and my dad's from El Salvador. Um, I am Latina, CIS female, um, and I went to both private and public education in New York City. So I had no teachers of color, I had a bunch of nuns. Um, <laughs> Attila the nun and Conan the librarian. You know, you know who you are. Um, I had a few teachers who later on came out as part of the LGBTQ community, but otherwise, um, growing up in a, in a Catholic school, it was just not something you ever talked about. Okay, I thought um, Joy talked a little bit about history, and I thought we'd talk a little bit more about history. Um, as I was just talking about, and I think all our panelists know, there is a big mismatch um, in our state today and in the nation today um, with you know, a much higher percentage of white teachers um, when there's a much, again, when the uh, student population is growing ever more diverse. But it wasn't always that way, and Joy, as a historian in education, thought you could tell us a little bit more about why that is? Well, as I'm hoping all of you know, it was illegal for black and white children to go to school in the South, right? You remember that from your history class? Uh, and so that necessitated black teachers for those schools. These were pub I'm talking particularly about public schools, public K through 12. And so there was a huge teaching force, a black teaching force in the South. There were black teacher professional organizations. There were all kinds of other kinds of professional development and systems and um, things in place that bound black teachers together to work towards different things to improve the quality of the curriculum, their own professional development. Many of them were um, highly educated. They had master's degrees, which wasn't a requirement, but um, white places wouldn't hire them, so they end up at black schools. And there were, I think what the, the what people usually think of when they think about segregated education in the South for blacks is that it was necessarily substandard, and that is not accurate. It is not an accurate depiction of the way black educational history was. There were inc some schools struggled, but there were other schools that had students, even in the late 19th century, that's like, like 1899, I think, around in there, where there was a school in um, Washington, D.C. There's a, a person in the audience here who's got a family member who had gone, her, your mother, um, had gone to Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C., and students there had, teach, black students there, had black teachers who had master's degrees. They outperformed um, local white students on standardized tests. Uh, they were performing incredibly well. So then the Brown versus Board of Education decision happens, and nothing turns on a dime. Mississippi didn't desegregate its schools until 1970. They said that was with all deliberate speed. 54 to 1970, or 55 to 1970. Um, and what happens is that all of those black teachers, all of those black superintendents, all of those black principals, and janitorial staff, and all these, everybody is, um, is fired. And so it's not that these black teachers found new jobs in these now, quote unquote, desegregated schools. They were out of work. And the teaching force has never recovered. So it, that's the South. But in the North, black teachers weren't being hired either, except in these local black communities. Uh, and so you have, I just, because another thing I don't want you to leave, leave you with is that racism only exists in the South. It exists everywhere. Uh, and so black teachers, there have been a variety of mechanisms that have been used to, to keep black teachers out of the profession, to create, it's, it's a, it can be incredibly hostile space for teachers of color, not just black teachers. But the point is that now the teaching force looks a, a particular way, but it's th that that's been, um, if not part of some grand conspiracy, somewhat intentional uh, in the way that it's happened. But I think people just assume that black people aren't attracted to teaching. They were. But I think for a lot of kids, a lot of kids of color, not just black kids now, probably the thought of aspiring to be a teacher makes no sense because they see their teachers as, I see kids in the audience, <laughs> as nobody they want to aspire to be like. Uh, and so why would you want to become that? 
Uh, it's another reason that I think that, that again, this is kind of intentional, semi-intentional. It's consequential. So there, my point is that there's a history as well as a present that um, helps to keep the number of teachers of color low. What do some of the other, other of you think about that? Agree, disagree, add on? I just wanted to add on real quick. I appreciate you sharing that history. And one of the things that I'm most inspired by is Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mom, who was a teacher in Chicago, um, a black woman who transformed the United States by having an open casket for her son who was lynched in the South. But what people don't usually know about Mamie Till is as a teacher in Chicago, she didn't just do that one watershed moment that showed people the brutality of this country against uh, black children, but she also was a teacher that fought against the discrimination of black teachers in Chicago. So they used to give teachers an oral exam, and if they had a black dialect, that was a way that they kept them from having a full-time job. And instead, they would give them substitute jobs, and they would be um, on part-time uh, salary without benefits, et cetera. And that, that um, it, just to say that racism isn't a Southern thing, right? And that um, it, it's been something we've had to fight the entire history of this country, and we're in the struggle again today um, in, in many different ways. And just to say about what's happening to the black teaching force that um, has historically been a place for at least some upward mobility for black communities that have faced um, an intense amount of institutional racism. But those, those teaching cores are being destroyed. And actually, uh, uh, if you haven't read the story in Mother Jones that came out a few months ago about the disappearance of black teachers, you should check that out. It shows that we've lost 26,000 black teachers in the last eight years in the United States. So it's not just that we aren't recruiting more teachers into a, a diverse um, teaching core. It's that we're actually wiping them off the map by the tens of thousands. And why and how is this happening? Well, I believe that the, this whole debate around education reform, we have the richest people the world has ever known, right, using their wealth to implement reforms that have nothing to do with actually improving education. So we get, we get all this talk about more high stakes testing. <laughs> the, the agenda by the richest people in the world is put more high stakes tests, bring in com common core uh, state standards and privatize education with charter schools. And those very reforms have a large role to play in pushing out black teachers all over the country. So in New Orleans, where they moved to 100% charter school, right? Now you push out the union that was protecting a lot of those black teaching jobs, and you bring in Teach for America, um, and that actually has brought in a whole lot more white teachers. And the similar process has played out in Chicago and Philadelphia. And I think we have to actually stand against the corporate education reform agenda uh, for an equity agenda. Anybody else want to add to that? No? Okay. So while we're on the um, topic of teachers, uh, you know, I, I, I think many of you agree that it's important that we have a more diverse teaching force. And I was wondering if I could again ask you to share some of your own personal experiences um, to help us understand why that's so important or why you think that's so important if you think it's so if you think it's important um, Who would like to start? I think I primed you guys for this. So I hope you have stories ready <laughs> I'll start um, You know when when I went to school I have Just a little bit of context my parents migrated to this country. My dad migrated because of the Civil War in El Salvador, and my mom was sent here to help the family um, back home. So her job was to come here, get a job, and send money back home. And for my parents, they wanted to instill the, the, the values of, of the Latino culture in, in me while I was growing up. And, but at the same time, I grew up in America where you know, you go to prom, you go to college. Um, you know, it's just, it's just a very different 
um, mindset, and I didn't have someone in school to help me navigate how to have both of those conversations at the same time. Like, I didn't have someone in school uh, to help me navigate how to, how to really explain to my parents what the SAT was or the PSAT was or, or why AP classes were really important um, or the culture of going to college because I, because I did go to a private school, but um, I'm, I'm what people would call uh, the privileged poor because my parents both worked 20-hour days to send me to private school. They had bought a house in a really, really crappy neighborhood in New York and my one option to go to public school was to go to the, the fifth lowest performing school in New York State. Um, so to go to that and then have this aspiration from the people that my mom was working for as a housekeeper that, you know, I have to go to college and that's just the way it is. I didn't have anybody in, um, as a teacher, as a mentor, as, as an adult, to really help me navigate how to have that conversation and also how to navigate being Latina in America. I had to explain to my friends what a quinceañera was and like why I had such a huge dress and like, <laughs> you know, and, and the birthday cake was eight feet tall and like, you know, a DJ and a mariachi and all that other stuff. Like, they didn't understand what was all of this, and they thought I was getting married, and it was just really weird. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I also had to explain to them, like, I, I can't go out till 2 or 3 in the morning on a Tuesday because I had, I had a curfew, and, you know, this was college. Like, I, I still had a, I still go home. I'm 42 years old. I go home. My fiancé is in the audience. He'll tell you. I, we go home. My mother's like, you'll be home by 10. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm like, well, I'm getting married. She's like, I don't care. Like, you're in my house. Um, you know, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have anybody that looked like me and could explain to my parents, like, what, what education was in this country. And no one explained to my parents that in this country, parents are engaged. And parents are assumed to be engaged. And if you're a parent in this country and you're not engaged, you're a bad parent. And no one explained that to my mom who was working um, two, two house, she would clean two houses from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., take a nap from 1.30 to 2.30, and then do the graveyard shift from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. at the hospital and then come home and sleep from 11.30 to 6 and be up to get my dad to go to work. Like to her, that was as engaged as she could be. To the educational system that I was going to, my mom was a bad mom because she couldn't go to a PTA meeting, right? And not having someone in, I'm getting emotional, not having someone that could explain that to me so that I could explain it to my parents was, was um, a betrayal of the educational system because I was, my mom was doing the best that she could to send me to private school and to the people at the private school, my mom was deficient. Uh, I, th I mean, as our country is incredibly diverse, I don't see how you could argue that the teaching force shouldn't be equally diverse. I don't, if you're a white person in the audience, we don't understand what it's like to go through education and necessarily never see someone at the front of the room who speaks, who acts, who has the same manners as your parents and what that means for a young person to never have essentially their parent up at the front of the classroom for them is incredibly difficult. Um, I mean, I guess if you're in the audience and you want to like hide behind your whiteness and you want to be like, oh, but it's not that important that people, you know, it should just be great teachers is what matters. Um, okay, um, think of it. So if we must hide behind whiteness, uh, think of it as if you're only, if you're getting 90% of your teachers are coming from one column, you're not getting the best and the brightest because you're going really deep down that column. <laughs> to have to hire that 90%. So if it bothers you, 
that, oh, but we shouldn't have to talk about that. Good, then just look at the data of like picking at the top from all columns. Uh, but I can speak from as an LGBT person, what it would have been like for me to have a teacher in the front of the classroom who, I mean, it would have changed my life for me to know that it's okay to be effeminate, that I have a future in the world, that I exist, that there is space for me, that I'm valued, and that not just that I'm valued, but that I also can succeed. Yeah. Kids need to see that. Like, I can be a wonderful teacher to all my students, but I'm, I still don't look like all of my students. And they need to see people in their buildings that look like them, that act like them, that sound like them. Oh, um, some of the things I'm thinking about in my own educational experiences was, especially when I was in uh, elementary school and was learning English, the teacher wanted to put me in special education. And my father had to, to challenge that, and especially as being a new immigrant to this country, um, he was struggling in finding the uh, support that he needed to challenge it. And so luckily, I wasn't put in because that would, I think, have also could have affected my educational outcomes. And I ended up you know, doing really well in college, especially in math, which is what they were also concerned about. And I'm a math teacher now. Um, but one of the things that I missed besides just having, like, I really wanted teachers of color, and I also really wanted critical um, educators of color, specifically, specifically in math, that could show me ways to ch use math to challenge injustices, because the only thing I really learned about was, like, cookies, like, how many cookies do you got? Um, <laughs> And I really don't care, I'm sorry. But um, I really wanted to see like, how can you use that to challenge you know, the water poisoning that happens and that's ha still happening in Flint? Um, how can you use you know, exponential equations to look at how we are you know, with mass incarceration or what is happening with what just the deportations that's happening in this country? And there's ways that you can do math to do that and that was never really shown to me and also or even recognizing like the contribution of my people like Indians we did a lot with math we really did um, <laughs> but y'all don't know that so um, I just think I wanted I wanted educators of color and I wanted educators of color that were critically using my education and uh, teaching me ways to challenge the injustices that are faced by my community Um, so I have a very vivid memory of being in third grade, and I went out to my parent-teacher conference in the hallway. Uh, the table was set up, and we had the little kid chairs, and um, I was comfortable in mine, but my mom and my teacher were squeezed into theirs. And I was very, very nervous about this meeting because uh, only a couple days earlier, I had cl climbed up the vent in the room, there was like this huge vent, and you could get like halfway up it. Um, and I hid up there so that I could let kids in during lunch and we could play in the room. And <laughs> it wasn't a good look. Um, and so I was really nervous about this, this meeting, and um, thankfully, uh, the teacher didn't raise that there. She, she um, raised a bigger issue, which was that I was dramatically behind in reading. And she brought out my standardized test scores and put them on the table. And those, that image is seared into my memory. I knew from that moment in third grade until about halfway through college that I wasn't intelligent. I, I had the proof for you. I could prove it to you because I could show you my scores and tell you that I wasn't very valuable intellectually at all. And I had a lot of shame and deep humiliation, and you know, I didn't want to take any advanced classes at Garfield. Um, I, it, was, um, it was really, school was humiliating and a constant struggle. Um, I had almost no teachers of color. Anytime I made a mistake in class, um, I assumed that it, it spoke for everyone that looked like me, and it was an incredible burden to bear. And it wasn't until about halfway through college that I found 
that you could actually understand race and that it was, it was created at a certain point in, a, in order to hold people down and that um, we could actually challenge it. And there was, actually, there was purpose to, to education to help us fix some of these problems that, that I began um, to change and to see a value in education. And what I've tried to do is give that to students. And when I see them organizing, uh, after Mike, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, the Black Student Union at Garfield led a mass walkout on the precinct and demanded justice, right? Um, <laughs> after Donald Trump was elected this year, uh, students in the Black Student Union and many of the other student groups led a mass walkout uh, at Garfield and all over the city students led walkouts and over 10,000 students and when I see those kind of actions I know that, that um, my work uh, as a teacher of color, as a black educator um, uh, can be very powerful and important to helping to transform public education. I think about this, I guess, in a couple ways. One is I resonate with exactly what you were talking about. Like, so having, being able to see yourself reflected back is incredibly powerful because for kids, teachers are, besides their parents, like the only authority, the authority figures they interact with the most. And I know I used to say to my, I uh, still say to many of my students, I said, I, I suspect that I'm the first person of color you've ever had to interact with in a position of authority. And for a lot of them, they're like, you're right. Uh, and I'm like, well, watch this. Uh, <laughs> but it's, I, I think for, for, it's important for students of color, it's important for all of our students, right, to see different ways of what authority, what leadership looks like. So that's one of the ways I think about it. Another way that I think about it is I, I, um, now that I work in a college of education and I have children, I care very deeply and intimately about the kind of education future teachers receive when they're learning and about the professional development they will get after. Because I don't believe that you can learn everything you need to learn, whether it's about your subject matter or anything else, in that five quarters or whatever it is. And for me, um, I'm more interested in that the social justice curriculum. Right? So you're not going to take a class on social justice usually. I mean, you might, uh, uh, but probably not. But the, I want teachers who are equipped to talk about racism, sexism, homophobia, colonialism, imperialism. So when things come up in their classrooms, when, when a student says something to another student that you know is way off, this, the teacher doesn't say, oh, I don't really feel comfortable about talking about this, and they allow it to happen, uh, you know, because they're afraid to say something. So I, I, I totally believe that more teachers of color are necessary. One, because they diversify teacher education programs and force those, all the rest of the people to talk differently in the teacher ed program. Then they're going to force their staffs to talk differently in a way that they might have. They're not going to let things continue to go down the way that it's been going down. You know, trying to do honors for all. That's incredibly important, getting people on board with that. There are all kinds of allies, and so diversifying the teaching force is just one mechanism to instill, my point is, to instilling more and more change throughout the system, and then eventually into the principal ranks. That's another place that's incredibly important. Superintendency. That. Well, thank you. That was a great segue to the next question, <laughs> which was, um, as we were preparing for this panel, um, you know, we talked about the fact that, yes, given there's, it's very important to diversify the teacher workforce, but Education So White is about a lot more than that. It's about the curriculum. It's about policies. It's about finance. Um, what about those things? What changes would you like to see in those areas? Because it's not just about who's at the front of the classroom. Sharon, do you want to start That's on me. that one? <laughs> All righty. Um, so I'm not going to tackle all of that because I, I don't have that much time. Um, okay, one, one example. <laughs> but um, so, the, so the, the thing about finance, which is super sexy, um, <laughs> the thing about finance is that 
we, we as, a, as a people, we as an individual, we as a nation, we as a state, we prioritize, we fund what we prioritize, right? So I prioritize having a home, so I pay my rent. Oh, well, now it's a mortgage, so now I pay more. Um, but for me, having a roof over my head is a priority. Having food, having um, gas for my car, those are, those are things that are really, really important to me. But also then, you know, we have these little, what I call luxuries, which are really necessities in my job, which is, you know, panels like this, professional development. Thing. There are things that we all prioritize in our life. The state does not prioritize educating black and brown kids because it does not fund educating black and brown kids. The state, the state pays almost three times the amount of money to incarcerate black and brown children than it does to educate black and brown children. It, the state, the educational system, the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, they have allowed a system that, that perpetuates kicking three and four-year-olds out, out of preschool. For, th for behaviors and actions that are developmentally on target for their age. So we're kicking kids out for laughing too loud, for being rambunctious, and for just being kids. But we're kicking out black and brown kids. We're not kicking out white kids. And we're doing that more and more throughout the K through 12 system. And we know that the state has to pay for educators, and we need to value the cost of an educator. Like, paying $45,000 a year for one teacher in Seattle is ridiculous. Like, we need to pay, like, we just need to pay more, and that just needs to happen. But, and, and I'm just gonna do that, so here we are. Um, <laughs> But the reality is, is that the way that this state funds education, they knowingly perpetuate inequity. And, and they work on the assumption that the school board, the business office, and the, the human resources office of your local school district is going to put the money in the right places to educate the kids that are in the opportunity and achievement gap. And that's a huge assumption, because we know that most of those people are white. And we know that most of those people probably don't live in the same neighborhood as their schools. So we're, we're assuming that people who don't live in the same neighborhoods as their kids that they work with are going to prioritize educating those kids to get them out of the opportunity and achievement gap. And that's a huge assumption that we're working on. And it's the state legislature that's like, yeah, that's what they're going to do. And we have hundreds of years of proof that they don't do that. Plus, we have the most regressive tax system in the, in the country. So if a huge aeronautical company were to pay its taxes, <laughs> maybe we could pay for teachers. Boy, time is going really fast. I just got the five minute warning that we gotta move. So I want you guys each to have a chance to say something quickly on this subject, and then we'll have like a quick lightning round. One, one, one thing you think would be important to improve um, that schools or anybody else, school districts or anybody else could do today to, to better support um, students of color. But if you want to add on to... Ditto. Ditto, ditto she okay. <laughs> but anything about the bigger issues of curriculum, or uh, school policies, just make it fast so we can get to the questions in the audience. <laughs> just easy subject to tackle. Yeah. Can I, can I just add one more? Because 
I'm the shy one of the group. <laughs> you know, we can talk school finance, I can talk school finance all night, but I think one of the most important things is that white teachers, white administrators, and white people in the classroom and in the school building have to stop being afraid of talking about race. It, it, is no, it is no longer fair for the, for the few teachers of color to be put on the racial equity teams and try to solve racism. It is, it's no longer okay for the one or two members that are, the one or two teachers that are part of the LGBTQ community to end sexism and oppression. Like, it's not okay anymore. That was not a system that we created. It is a system that white people created and they have to be a part of that conversation. Okay, this is the light, I'm just reminding you, this is the lightning round. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll try to, make, okay, so on, on this big question, I mean, one of the things we tried to do to engage the entire Seattle School District in a discussion about race and equity was Black Lives Matter at School Day. Um, and we pushed an initiative in the Seattle Public Schools to ask teachers to wear this shirt. It says, Black Lives Matter, we stand together. And then I put a motion forward in our caucus that we add the hashtag say her name to talk about violence against women as well um, to the shirt. And many hundreds of teachers wore the one with this. And so when we did that initiative, we had three points that we wanted to get across with um, how we could advance uh, an agenda of Black Lives Matter in our school. Number one was restorative justice instead of zero tolerance discipline. <laughs> right? We know the Seattle public schools suspend black students at four times the rate of white students for the very same infractions. We wanted to push detracking, and that's something I hope Nathan will get a chance to talk more about. And he's had incredible leadership at Garfield with detracking so that we can get students of color in the more advanced classes, right? And absolutely. Uh, and we also uh, believe very deeply in um, the need for ethnic studies programs, and that. <laughs> right? That, that all students should get to learn about the cultural diversity that exists in Seattle, in, in our country. And I would add that we should add gender studies programs and learn about uh, sexuality and women's liberation as well. Okay. Who's next? Nathan? Joy? No, I mean, I, I, you can do your lightning round. Oh, yeah, yours is the ditto. Okay. Nathan, do you want to add something? Is this the lightning round one? This is the lightning oh, round, man. Oh. <laughs> um, oh, goodness, so much to say. Um, I think it would, uh, so teaching is a political act, and I tell my students that. Um, talk to your young people in your families. Uh, talk to uh, people in your neighborhood about how, uh, if you want to vilify a teacher who wants to talk about race in the classroom, or who wants to bring up homophobia, or bring up social justice, uh, yes, that teacher has a political stance in the classroom, as does the teacher who doesn't bring it up in the classroom. <laughs> Silence in the classroom is a political stance. Uh, and I think we, especially white people, are very uncomfortable acknowledging that. And I think that is a huge step, especially white people in America can acknowledge, is that silence is political statement. Can I just, I'm sorry, can I add real quick, I forgot to say that I was amazed <laughs> that 3,000 teachers wore this shirt in the Seattle Public Schools and that there are many teachers of all backgrounds that are interested in having this conversation and we need to fund the professional development right, and make the space by getting these high stakes tests out of the way so we can talk about what really matters in education, how to empower our kids, right? So there's, it's clear to me that many teachers want to have this conversation, but they need help, and it's, and it's time we reprioritize our funding towards the things we know our kids need. Yeah, um, I really agree with a lot of you saying, and especially what hit home was that teaching's not neutral and how we have um, sometimes like just gone after teachers for um, brainwashing is what they say or things like that, but it is, 
it is a political act and that silence really says a lot and then specifically with what you're choosing in terms of curriculum we need critical curriculum we need curriculum that really prioritizes and centers community and ancestral and indigenous knowledge and um, we also really also need to support teachers of color and I mean I have a community of my I've been teaching for five years now and actually will be leaving the classroom at the end of this year which was really was really hard but I found out that that's average most teachers of color leave after five years and that's me now um, but we really need to to support us and to support teachers of color that are committed especially to racial and social justice Okay, now it's your turn. Um, people with questions can line up at the microphones, which I think are on both sides of the room. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Do I see anybody out there? Yeah, oh, there's someone coming. Also, I'll remind those who are watching remotely that there's the hashtag education so white, and you can tweet your questions to us as well. So state your name. Oh, and I should also say, please ask a question. Um, please don't make a statement or a very long preamble. We want to get to as many questions as we can. I will cut you off and ask you to cut to the question. So state your name and your question. My yes. name is Marcia Cutting, and I would like to raise the issue of people with visible disabilities as teachers. Is that... You have a question in there, or you just would you like the panelists to address, or basically I'd like the panelists to address? I mean, I I have a doctorate, and in 23 years, God help me, of education, I never saw another teacher with a visible disability. Mm. I think it fits kind of in the same category of of people understanding that our kids understanding that. There is no normal, you know, I mean, that, that um, leaders look all kinds of ways and behave in different kinds of ways and are still leaders, right? And so that you, you know, you, you want kids to not be shocked when they see someone new. I mean, part of it is because we live in kind of siloed communities, but I think it fits under the same kind of an umbrella that I think for kids to say, yes, this, she can be a leader or he can be a leader and, and be what, you know, you know, dot, 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 after that, I think it fits under the same kind of an umbrella. Great. Thank you. Take one from this side. Hello, Joy. Hello, we met in the parking lot. Yes, we did. You tried to act like you didn't know anything. <laughs> now, now we know each other. Where's your mom? Uh -huh. She's right over there. <laughs> anyway, so... I currently live a little bit further north than I'm assuming most of you do. I live on Kamano Island. And out there, it's a much more closed-minded community. It's not very open to LGBTQ, and I'm pretty sure there's about 24 black people out there. <laughs> there's like 24 of us. We don't have a group email or anything. Anyway, so I am, go to a smaller school, Lincoln Hill High School which has about 140 students, which shares the same campus with another school who has, I believe, two to 3,000 students. In my smaller school, we have a more tight-knit community which does have more white teachers and there are, no, are literally no colored teachers there whatsoever. And I'm happy that you guys opened our eyes to this because I'm pretty sure not 100% of us were very, um, we didn't have a stronger focus on this as much as we should have and thank you for bringing your eyes to that, first of all. Do you think that smaller schools are more important for the development of youth in creating a stronger community so that students feel more supported when they're growing towards their goals and aspirations? Great. Who'd like to take that one? Small, small schools. I mean, you as a teacher, like think about cohorts. I think you as a teacher, yeah. professional teacher is great. Uh, I think small schools can be incredibly beneficial. Uh, you saw it recently with the Highline School District where they've kind of actively tried to break up the small school model that was actually showing quite uh, a lot of improvements uh, in students' lives. Uh, there's things that larger schools can do to implement 
a small school environment within a larger comprehensive high school. Garfield's going to do it next year with academies. Franklin already does it with their academies, so there's things that can be successful because large comprehensive high schools can be kind of daunting and you can get lost in the swarm. Can I just add a historical um, asterisk to that? So one of the things that these segregated schools had in the South was what one scholar calls institutional caring. Um, and so the, these kids knew that the teachers cared about them, that they lived in the same communities, they went to the same churches, um, their parents, the engagement looks different, parental engagement looked different because parents were working, but they were engaged, there's different ways. And it was, so institutional caring is one of the things that you can get, it's not inevitable at a small school, and it's not, not inevitable at a big school, but it has to be intentional. And so I think whether it's a big school or a small school, in, uh, institutional caring is something that um, helps propel kids towards their futures. And just real briefly, I would say that um, the most important thing is small classes, right? Because then the, it's about the relationship with kids between each other and with the, with the teacher. And so we voted in this state to lower the class size and the state legislature said, I don't care. Um, we'd rather fund Boeing and, and you know, the rest of these corporations than, than actually help teachers build those relationships with kids. And I was gonna say something also really quickly. I teach at Seattle World School, which is a small school that um, serves recent immigrants and refugees to the US. And it, yeah, beautiful place. Y'all should clap for it. Um, <laughs> My assistant principal's here, and I love her. Thanks for coming, Patricia. Um, but it is really beautiful to have just this community, and I, it made a really big difference for me to start teaching there and being in a small school where I see and know all of my students, and I'm in the hallway and seeing and knowing all of them. Um, but one of the things that also is that within the district we get lost, like we've been Seattle World School for six years and nobody knows our name. They still think we're SBOC. Um, so I think that's one of the, the struggles and specifically like districts need to do a better job is supporting small schools. Great. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Jasmine Rich and my question was given the recent unanimous $2 million um, approval for buses. What recommendations do you have for the communities, teachers, families, to help advocate for $2 million for professional development for the things that you're talking about? Drug and alcohol intervention education for teachers and communities where the city just approved $2 million. What would you suggest we can do to speak to the city council or the classroom teacher or the school board to focus that amount of dollars towards something that can, I don't know, make um, access the communities that are disenfranchised and uh, marginalized in Seattle. Okay. And you're talking about the recent city council decision to um, fund extra buses to have uh, two school start times. Um, I mean, you want me to jump in? Okay, I would just say, um, we're in an all-out struggle for what kind of society we want to live in. They're the eight richest people on the planet have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people in the world, right? All the wealth is being concentrated at the top, and that's the fundamental problem of why we don't have the resources that our classrooms need. And our state legislature is just being paid bribes by corporations to continue to perpetuate this inequality in the tax structure. So it's going to take a revolt <laughs> to change this situation. It's going to take a rebellion of parents, students, and teachers uniting um, to have the social force to actually wrestle that wealth away from the people who are hoarding it and use it for us. And, and just some ideas for that revolt, I would say, um, one, I think that Teachers could go out on strike and say, we will reopen the schools when you're ready to fund them, right? Um, parents, <laughs> parents and PTAs could make the same claim, right? And have a parent strike and say, we will send our kids back to school when you're ready uh, to, to honor them. And, and lastly, I would just say that uh, one thing I tried in 2011 was I went down to, before McCleary was passed, it was in a lower court that said that there wasn't 
enough funding, and I went and attempted a citizen's arrest of the state legislature. <laughs> I mean, maybe we could go do that in mass this time. Uh, it, I ended up in jail. The officer didn't have the same interpretation of the law as I did. Um, <laughs> But we need to do something, right, to, to build this rebellion for the wealth that, that exists in our state. Anything to add to that or move on? Yeah, move on? Ahead. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sean Kim. I hope I'm not too contentious here. I am a Washington Teach for America alum, and I now teach at a charter school back home in Houston, Texas. Just want to say in my small town in Wapato, Washington, the staff was 90% white, despite the student body on Yakima Indian Reservation being 70% Latino, 20% Native American. But back home at my charter school in Houston, we are incredibly diverse. To give you a small sample size, in my seventh grade team, there were six black teachers, one white, one Asian, and one Hispanic teacher. So I guess my question might be, just to push back a little bit, um, how might, let me say, successful charter schools aren't going anywhere anytime soon in places like Houston, how might charter schools traditional public schools, private schools, work hand in hand alongside each other to combat this issue that we've been talking about tonight, that education is so white. So I'm, I'm gonna dip my toe into this one. Um, <laughs> you know, having lived in various different states, this state is the only one where I've seen families torn apart versus, with the charter versus non-charter school situation, like, it was crazy here uh, when the vote happened and there was like families not talking to each other and like divorces were happening, it was just nuts. Um, it is nuts. Uh, at the end of the day, the charter school versus char non-charter school situation is an adult s problem around a child-centric issue. Right, it's adults not being able to talk to other adults, focusing on what's good for kids. And I say that because every child is an individual learning being. And not every child is going to learn in the same exact box in which we're trying to put them in. Right, so... I was privileged that I was sent to a private school. If the vitriol around charter school versus non-charter school had happened back then, I probably would not have been sent to a private school. I would have been sent to this god-awful public school, and I don't know where my life would be. Not, you know, I don't know where my life would be. But I, I think, I think if we, we're a, we're, we're a huge nation of choice, and only in the public education realm is choice a bad thing. And it's, it, we have to be able to give our, our parents the, a choice, but the choice should be between a really good neighborhood school or a really good charter school or a really good private school. It shouldn't be a crappy public school to a somewhat crappy okay charter school to a private school that they can't afford. Like, every school should be an excellent school no matter where you live. I'm guessing there might be another response as well. Anyone, anyone else want to? I mean, um, I'll just be brief, I, but I do think that um, I, I oppose charter schools because I think that um, we need, I, I, I think that the democratic governance of the public system is worth fighting for to maintain and, and the private boards that run charter schools um, are outside of the public domain of, of, of the elected school board, and I think that's a fundamental problem with democracy. I also look at some of the recent studies that come out that show charter schools actually push out students of color at higher rates um, than, than the public schools, and, and that troubles me. So. Thank you. Hi, folks. My name is Andrew Nepstead. I've thought about going to education for a really long time. Uh, anyway, uh, these are very important conversations to be having, but sometimes there's some pushback. Back at my alma mater, Evergreen, a guy's being compared to Rosa Parks 
for heroically resisting going to an optional, optional diversity training day, and it's blowing up in the media right now. But anyway, uh, what would you folks say to folks like Brett who just can't seem to see their own privilege or, you know, intentional or not, how, you know, they might be a part of systems of oppression whether they want to be or not. So what, I guess, would you folks say to folks pushing back against uh, diversity training, the, the, the more or less mostly conversations you guys have been having here? Thank you. I don't really talk to strangers, and that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was all I had to say. I mean, I really, I, I am not, I think some people are good at that work, and some people aren't. And I get to, uh, I just can't, I can't, I'm not able to function as highly as I'd like to, and I start <laughs> losing my words, and uh, it just doesn't end well. I, I was also gonna, oh, sorry. <laughs> Say also this is where, like, you know, white allies come in, because it shouldn't be on people of color to have those conversation always. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. Hi, um, my name is Nakia. I just, I guess, spent my first year working in the education system. I've been getting paid by the education system, actually, but I've been working for education for a little while now. And um, I spent my first year in Seattle. I just moved here in an independent school. And um, when you talk about social justice education, I think we've adapted that, but we've kind of like plateaued at there is inequities and like we're not really going beyond that so what do you do when you're kind of like oh we we acknowledge it and we're going to put that in our curriculum but we are not really looking at going beyond that and it, yeah who would like to take that one nathan you can jump in too uh, oh, oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, um i think it requires uh critically looking at your curriculum constantly. Uh, as soon as a group of educators, especially since statistically it's a group of white people in the room, feel that uh, they've reached some sort of consensus or they're like, okay, we've mastered how to talk about race in the room now. <laughs> um, they should look at themselves and realized they had not. Uh, in all honesty, um, I think it's, um, I mean, it's, you, you have to change the curriculum in ways that you can't even imagine that you have to change the curriculum. Uh, and um, one thing I was gonna say is, I, when you hit that plateau, I think you wanna be using this critical education for something. So like for an example, in my class, um, a few years back, my students used Best Line of Fit to challenge a school board decision to move us to yet another temporary location. And because of that and the work that was being done in the classrooms by writing letters and the cross-collaboration, we actually convinced the school board from a vote by a vote of four to three to have our first permanent location. So you are not just studying about those inequities, but you are challenging them. That's how social movements happen. This, this is, I mean, it's, you read it. I mean, that's what, ha that's what happened here in the US. These kids that people talk about, like being activists in the 60s, they were in schools where that was being fed. They were being fed by that. So it's exactly that. There is no plateau. It's now, this is the knowledge. What are you going to do with it? Oh boy, here we go. Um, I've been teaching for 10 years. I'm a former journalist. I, this has been an eye-opening experience for me to go from journalism to government, tele, government cable television to deciding I'm going to be a teacher after being a foster parent and seeing what was going on. A ninth grader did not have any multiplication tables in her head. What's going on with this? I decided to go get that master's and become a teacher and go to this school district and oh, my God, what an awakening these last 10 years have been for me. Everything that you've said about, and being the only black teacher in my school, where people are choosing whether they want to know about difference or not, that is a choice. 
I am so sorry because I know you wanted me to make a question. Yes. I got a question. <laughs> Please. You don't want me to get started. But I will say this. Um, what I'm seeing, especially after having the social services background and what I'm seeing, I do home visits. We don't do home visits, I was told. How else are you going to find out what's going on in the kindergarten? Child, child sitting there, she's not talking. You got to go see what's going on at home. Hoarding. Hoarding. So, and your question is? And the question is, do you see the idea of mentoring? If every child, because we haven't got time for these babies to wait for a, another group of, of educators to come along that are ready, culturally relevant educators who might know more than one language, English, and who are comfortable being in, in environments where they are different from others. What about mentors for every child at, at risk? What about a mentor for every child to follow with that child? There's enough resources with people so that they can have the resources to have an instrument, swimming lessons, be there and see them when, they, when they're at school, check on that homework, and when they're acting up, come to the school and sit down with the teacher. And you're talking about what you were going through with, um, with your family and, and the economics. And if you got folks with lower income, and, and wouldn't they love to have an auntie or somebody that's coming there with that child every day and seeing that they get a good start, and then all children can learn. I just know that there's got to be more than what we're doing, and it's got to come faster than what is coming now. I think you just answered Thank you. your question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think she just answered her own question. Yeah, I think, I think she did. <laughs> so, so that's a yes? That's a yes. Like, got it. Okay, I think we have, how much more time do we have? Roughly about two minutes? Okay, time for one more question. Um, I'm a sophomore at Garfield High School, and I know that I'm able to go to school wearing a shirt. I'm able to engage in discussions with my classmates and teachers, and I can like walk out. But how do I directly engage with the political structures that, like, um, that cause these kinds of things? <laughs> I, I think that's that? an amazing question. <laughs> you know, it, it's a great reminder that citizenship is more than voting. Yeah. You know, so you might not be old enough to vote, but that doesn't mean you can't be an active member of this community, right? Um, you know, I, I, I suspect that you're probably already doing things if this is already on your mind, whether it's through um, different groups um, on, on your campus, like at, your, at, your, at Garfield, um, um, becoming allied with different t um, teachers. I think, I think a lot of what has to happen is getting educated about how and where change happens. That's one of the things, like, so I work at the University of Washington, and I often have students who are pissed off about something, and they'll go demonstrate, but they're in the wrong place. Like, that's not where the decision happens. You need to be protesting over there. Uh, <laughs> but they don't know. And so I think for, you know, for, for all of us, I think studying the system, understanding where decisions are made, and then applying pressure, a particular kind of pressure that looks different in different places, being strategic is basically what I'm talking about. And there are all kinds of ways that high school kids um, can participate in that and learn, and it's going to help you now and it'll help feed your critical thinking skills and plotting and planning strategies as you grow into an adult. I think it's amazing that this is on your radar and an amazing question. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that was a wonderful last question. Sorry we couldn't get to more. I think some of the panelists will be able to stay around um, and will be out in the lobby afterwards. So if you haven't, didn't have a chance, you might have a chance out there. So once again, please give a big round of applause to all of our panelists tonight.